Well, UPS may be the tip of the iceberg. Our next guest warns the Fed at this point is impotent in controlling inflation. Those are his words. And we could be back for a flashback to the 1970s. Peter Bookvar is the CIO of Bleakley Advisory Group and a CNBC contributor. Peter, great to have you with us. You think this whole transitory notion of inflation is baloney, basically. Why? Well, let's break out inflation between services and goods. Over the last 20 years, services inflation X energy has averaged an annual increase of 2.7 percent. Goods prices are flat. They're zero. They've averaged zero. So this discussion is really about the good side. So what we're having this year is a reacceleration of services inflation, which will go back to trend or even higher, considering what's going on in the housing market. And we're discussing now a cyclical rise in goods prices. And is it lasting a quarter, two quarters, or maybe two years? And I think this is going to be longer lasting, therefore not transitory in the Fed's definition, even though we're not exactly clear on the Fed's definition of transitory. Is it a few months when you work out the base effects, or is it something more? But I think if the prints this summer, in July, August, and even into September, are hot, that's going to tell us that it's not so transitory. The NFIB Small Business Optimism Index yesterday revealed that those that are looking to raise selling prices rose to the highest level since 1981. That is not something that just goes away in a few months. It is now becoming embedded. And it's not just commodity prices, it's transportation costs, it's packaging costs, it's labor now. And this sort of just gets into the psychology, which I think is just beginning. We've been seeing producer price pressures now for about six months. It's now only beginning to filter into the consumer side and being now passed on. So, Peter, it, it, it's Tim. Thanks for joining us. Your views on inflation and the Fed, I think, have been very clear. You write one of the best newsletters out there. And so here's the question. The harder question is, what's the Fed to do? What do you want to see the Fed wake up tomorrow and do? Because, uh, you know, yes, we, we don't want to see them buying, you know, 10 year Apple paper or AAA bonds. Um, but, but what's the answer, even though we know policy is offsides? OK, so QE right now, the only thing QE is doing is psychologically lifting asset prices and monetizing U.S. debt. There's no direct transmission between QE and economic activity. So they need to start weaning us off, at least on the QE, just to get started. But that's the amazing thing about how behind the curve they are, because all we're debating is tapering QE. Even when they're done with that, which could take well into next year or the year after, they still have rates at zero. So they're still in a very difficult position. And just to add on to that NFIB comment with high selling prices, those that expect a better economy actually fell to an eight-year low. There are stagflationary type signals that we're getting in many different industries that really makes the central bank's job extraordinarily difficult because if they try to tap on the brakes to deal with uh, inflation, well, then they threaten uh, to slow the economy further from what's already stagflationary type situation. So they're in an enormously difficult spot. And but I think that they're going to have to start ripping this bandaid off soon. Peter, it's Karen. Let me sort of play devil's advocate a little bit. As we reopen, it takes a while. So how long will that be before we really get to? All right. This is the new sort of, you know, the economy running at whatever its real level is, not a reopen, which is obviously turbocharged. That would seem to me to be a little longer than just the next month or two or three of data. And could that then show transitory without showing stagflation? It's a good question. I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't want to sound so confident that I know how this is going to play out. But yeah, as, as the economy further reopens, do these supply chains respond? But I argue that that a lot of the things that we're seeing right with price pressures could last because of a few different things, and that is underinvestment. Ten years plus of underinvestment in housing. Take shipping, for example. Remember, every single thing that is made in this world ends up on a boat, a plane, uh, a, a, a rail car, or a truck. Well, we saw a huge amount of bankruptcies in the trucking business in 2019, a reduction of capacity that's not coming back anytime soon. So that's going to lead to a few years of trucking pricing power. We've seen massive consolidation in the container shipping market, which is leading to pricing power in that part of the, uh, the economy. Now, maybe we'll get some, some cargo capacity back as passenger planes come back online because they take a lot of cargo. But we still see, I mean, notwithstanding what UPS said today, 
them and FedEx certainly have an enormous amount of pricing power uh, that they haven't had in a while. Uh, it's going to take two years to bring semiconductor plants back. It's going to take more than that to bring copper mines back. You can imagine it being an oil executive. The last thing you're going to do is ramp up uh, in investment in oil and gas when every single day you hear about somebody who wants to put your industry out of business. So there, there are deeper uh, uh, reductions in investment that we've been seeing over the last 10 years that's going to manifest itself, I believe, in stickier goods prices, which I said earlier, combined with pretty sticky and persistent services inflation, and you're going to get higher aggregate inflation. And one last point on this is that the global rates market, the level of interest rates, is not positioned for any upside surprise in inflation that lasts. Now, if the Fed funds rate was 2.5%, 3%, the 10-year was 4 to 5%, we had more normal interest rates around the world, but then we'd be able to absorb a period of time of higher inflation. But with negative rates, with zero rates, with microscopic rates everywhere, we're just not positioned for any upside inflation surprises that last more than just a few months. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Always great to get your perspective on things. Peter Bookvar, Bleakly Advisory Group. Um, Guy Dami, I think key was the last point that Peter made, and that is that the market is not positioned for any inflation upside. It's the expectation and the positioning of it. And we're just not there. Yeah, I mean, and then I think the pushback would be, you know, the market was trying to position themselves for that when they sold the bond market off and 10-year yields went to 177. And maybe we're seeing sort of the after effects of that. There's so many there, there's so many facets to this. It's really interesting conversation. Clearly, Peter speaks to it much more intelligently than I do. But I think his fears are well placed. And again, he's not dogmatic. He's just reading the tea leaves. So we'll see what the CPI number is. We'll see how the market reacts to it. Uh, Dan brings up a great point. You know, this one and a half percent is a bit of a pivot point. The auction was good. Tim mentioned where we are in terms of the moving averages. It all leads seemingly to rates going lower. I just don't find myself in, in that camp. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.